In the previous video, we began our discussion about the content requirements for an easement. And we talked about Rio Number Park, where it was held that the right amounts to an easement only if it satisfies four requirements. And we've already looked at three of those requirements, namely, there must be a dominant and servient tenement, which is two plots of land. The dominant and servient owners must be different people, and the right must accommodate the dominant tenement. And in this video, we're now going to be looking at the fourth content requirement, and that is the right is capable of forming the subject matter of a grant. So let's get straight into it. The requirement that the right be capable of forming the subject matter of a grant is shorthand for a number of sub rules which restrict the rights which can qualify as easements. The right must not constitute a mere right of recreation possessing no utility or benefit. Two, the right must not be expressed in terms which are too wide or vague. Three, the right must not be inconsistent with the proprietorship or possession of the servient owner. The right must not benefit the dominant owner without activity on his part. And five, the right must not require the servient owner actively to do something except maintain a fence. So each sub rule must be satisfied if the right is going to count as an easement. And some commentators do actually, well, including Dixon, you may have heard of Dixon, I put sub rule number one here under accommodation. And we're going to talk about each of these sub rules in turn. So number one, the right must not constitute a mere right of recreation possessing no utility or benefit. So any right that is merely recreational cannot exist as an easement. The restriction was discussed by Evershed in relation to the right to use Ellenborough Park. If the proposition be well founded, we do not think that the right to use a garden can be called one of the mere recreation and amusement. Called one of mere recreation and amusement. No doubt a garden is a pleasure, but on our judgment, it is not a right having no quality either of utility or benefit. It's used for the purposes not only of exercise and rest, but also for such domestic purposes as taking out small children in perambulators is clearly beneficial to premises to which it is attached. So this demonstrates that this rule has very little practical bite. It will be quite easy to determine that a right has some sort of utility or benefit to a right owner, to a right over another's land. It's hard to think of a right that is merely recreational without delivering some sort of benefit or utility alongside it. So the second sub rule is the right must not be expressed in terms which are too wide or vague. And again, we can look at Rio Libre Park for this. In Rio Libre Park, Evershed held the right to full enjoyment of the pleasure ground capable of amounting to an easement. The enjoyment contemplated was the enjoyment of the vendor's ornamental garden in its physical state as such. The right, that is to say, of walking on or over those parts provided for such purposes, that is, pathways and lawns, to rest in or upon the seats or other places provided, and if certain parts were set apart for particular recreations, such as tennis or bowls, to use those parts for those purposes. But not to trample at will all over the park, to cut or pluck the flowers or shrubs, or to interfere in the laying out or upkeep of the park. Such use or enjoyment is, we think, a common and clearly understood conception. So although prima facie the right looks vague and wide, the court said that it was capable of amounting to an easement. Evershed gave a concrete meaning to what looks like a vague right, thus satisfying the requirement. So like the first rule, there seems to be little bite to this sub rule too. And Evershed contrasted the right before him with the indefinite and unregulated privilege of wandering at will over all or every part of another's field or park. So these are phrases that would probably fail. Let's look at the third content requirement, the third requirement, the third sub rule. The right must not be inconsistent with the proprietorship or possession of the servient owner. So this is an exam favourite. I would recommend you know this very well because this will probably come up in your exam if you have any, any question on easements. So make sure you know it. This sub rule prevents any right from existing as an easement if it is inconsistent with the proprietorship 
or possession of the servient owner. So a right that is too extensive, um, that it deprives the servient owner of their possession or ownership of part of their land, cannot exist as an easement. So a case where the requirement was held to be satisfied. Rights granting a use of land which is clearly demarcated and limited easily satisfy this rule. For example, the right to use a loo. It is true that during the times when the dominant owner exercised the right, the owner of the servient tenement would be excluded, but that, but this in greater or less degree is a common feature of many easements and does not amount to such an ouster of the servient owner's right to be incompatible with a legal easement. And that was said by Romer in Miller and Emsa products in 1956. So many rights easily satisfy this requirement. In other words, like clearly, they're not a challenge to the ownership or possession of the servient owner. For example, the right to use a loo, as we just said. The court said in this case, in, in Miller and Ems products, that although the dominant owner was exercising his right to exclude the servient owner from the relevant portion of the land, this exclusion was not of a degree necessary to come to the conclusion that the servient owner's proprietorship or possession had been taken away. So what about cases where it was not held to be satisfied. So, in Copeland and Greenhalf, 1952, so in this case, the claimant owned a house and an adjoining orchard. The orchard was accessed from the road by a strip of land. It was 150 feet long and about 15 feet wide. The defendant was a wheelwright and for a number of years had stored his vehicles on the claimant strip of land, using almost the entire strip. Okay, so he had a number of vehicles that he would store on this land. The High Court considered whether the right to store vehicles on a strip of land is capable of being an easement. And this is what Up John said in the case. I think that the right claimed goes wholly outside any normal idea of an easement. Practically, the defendant is claiming the whole beneficial use of the strip of land on the southeast side of the track there. He can leave as many or as few lorries there as he likes for as long as he likes. He may enter on it by himself, his servants and agents to do repairs work thereon. In my judgment, that is not a claim which can be established as an easement. It is virtually a claim to possession of the servient tenement, if necessary to the exclusion of the owner, or at any rate, to a joint user. So the court said that this was too extensive to exist as an easement. It involved too great of an incursion on the servient land. And in Grigsby and Melville in 1974, the court considered whether an easement of unlimited storage within a confined or defined space, a cellar in this case, is capable of existing as a matter of law. The point of the decision in Copeland and Greenhalgh was that the right asserted amounted in effect to a claim to the whole beneficial use of the Servian tenement, and for that reason could not exist as a mere easement. In the case before me, it is clear that the defendant's claim to an easement would give to all practical intents and purposes an exclusive right of uh, use over the whole of the confined space representing the Serbian tenement. I think I would be at liberty, if necessary, to follow Copeland and Greenhalgh. So, they said that the right was too extensive to be an easement. Now, there... There's not a huge amount of guidance in those cases as to when a right crosses from being okay to being extensive, so or being too extensive. How do we determine which side of the threshold our right lies? And the court has developed a two alternative and competing tests for determining whether a right satisfies this sub-rule. The first one is the reasonable use test. In London and Blenheim Estates in 1992, Judge Paul Baker QC asserts that a right is inconsistent with the servient owner's proprietorship or possession if the right granted in relation to the area over which it is to be exercised is such that it would leave the servient owner without any reasonable use of his land. And this reasonable use test was subsequently adopted by the Court of Appeal in Bachelor and Marlow in 2001, when determining whether a right to park six cars for 
nine and a half hours every day of the working week is capable of being an easement. And Tucky um, said in that case, the judge the, said that the servant's owner's right to use his land is curtailed altogether for intermittent periods throughout the week. Such a restriction would, I think, make the ownership of the land illusory. So the right was too extensive and could not be an easement. The second competing test is the possession and control test. So the test formulated in London and Blenheim Estates and applied in Bachelor and Marlow was criticised by the House of Lords in Moncrief and Jamison in 2007. And an alternative test based on whether the servient owner retains possession and control of the land was put forward. I do not see why a landowner should grant easements over his land to any extent that he wishes. I would, for my part, reject the test that asks whether the servient owner is left with any reasonable use of his land and substitute it for a test which asks whether the servient owner retains possession and subject to the reasonable exercise of the right in question, control of the servient land. So that probably explains it pretty well and I don't see any reason to discuss that further on that basis in terms of its definition, that defines it nicely. So. But I, I do want to ask one quick question, which is in what circumstances is a servient owner deprived of possession and control? And I brought up this quote, quotation from Lord Scott. Sole use of a coal shed for the storage of coal does not prevent the servient owner from using the shed for any purposes of his own that do not interfere with the dominant owner's reasonable use for the storage of coal. If the coal shed had been locked with only the dominant owner possessing a key and entry by the servient owner barred so that the dominant owner would have been in possession and control of the shed, I would have regarded it as arguable that the right granted was inconsistent with the servient owner's ownership and co inconsistent with the nature of an easement. So this possession and control test is quite an explicit and dramatic departure from the basis on which cases have been decided up to this point. It is a very different test to the reasonable use test and it suggests most of the previous case law has been wrongly decided, for example, Moncrief. So which, which of these two tests represents the law? And if you're in an exam, I would highly recommend you discussing both cases, both situations and both tests. So Moncrief and Jamison is a House of Lords authority, so the possession and control test must be taken seriously. However, their lordship's commented, comments in Moncrief were strictly obiter. The right in question to park two cars on an area significantly larger than they needed to accommodate them satisfied both the reasonable use and the possession and control test. Thus, in Verdi and China in 2008, the reasonable use test was still held to represent the law. This notwithstanding, the foundations have been laid should the Supreme Court wish to overrule Bachelor and Marlow in the future. So what test should represent the law? The test in Moncrief and Jamison can be readily explained and justified by the need to distinguish easements from the other rights in rem of lease so the right to exclusive possession of land and freehold, the right to proprietorship of land. There's quite an interesting border between an easement and the lease. Now, you may think you have an easement over a shed, but you might get to this requirement and realise that you know it's probably an, a lease instead. Mm -hmm. It is less clear why the category of easements should be further restricted in line with the reasonable use test. Lord Scott in Moncrief and Jamison said, I do not see why a landowner should not grant easements over his land to any extent that he wishes. I can think of no reason why if an area of land can accommodate nine cars, the owner of the land should not grant an easement to park nine cars on the land. The servant owner would remain the owner of the land and in possession and control of it. So let's look at an example so that we can apply this sub rule. So Claire is the registered proprietor 
of Blackacre and Richard is the registered proprietor of neighbouring Blueacre. At the rear of Blackacre is a garage capable of accommodating a single car. Claire grants Richard the right to park his Aston Martin in the garage for 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Claire retains the garage key. Is Richard's right inconsistent with Claire's proprietorship or possession of the garage? So, we've got two tests. Moncrief asks us whether the Serbian owner retains possession and control over the land. So, does Claire retain possession and control of the garage? Given the way this requirement has been interpreted in Moncrief itself, the answer's got to be yes, as Claire retains the garage key. She still has possession and proprietorship of the garage. All other things being equal, this can be an easement under Moncrief. But we get a different outcome from Bachelor Marlowe, which asks us whether Claire retains any reasonable use of the land in question. So given Richard's right, does Claire retain reasonable use of the garage? The answer is going to be no, at least by analogy to Bachelor itself. So we get different outcomes with the different tests. And if you get a problem question like this, I would recommend you exploring both tests and see what the outcome would be. Let's have a look at a second example. So Claire is the registered proprietor of Blackacre and Richard is the registered proprietor of neighbouring Blueacre. There is a shed in Blackacre's grounds. Claire grants Richard the right to use the entire shed, aside from a couple of square metres in the corner where Claire has stacked a few hundred books for storage purposes. Is Richard's right inconsistent with Claire's proprietorship or possession of the shed? Clearly, Richard's right is fine on the Moncrief test. With Bachelor Marlow, Claire must have reasonable use of the land. Does she given Richard's extensive right. Well, who knows really? Um, you would have to conclude yourself by looking at the cases. So just give a sane reason process and it won't really matter about your decision. So just have a look at both tests and come to a logical conclusion. Use the evidence you have from both the facts and from case law and you'll be absolutely fine. So yeah. That's about it with that example. So we can now move on to sub rule four and five. So sub rule four, the right must not benefit the dominant owner without activity on his part. So it demands activity on the part of the dominant owner. So a right which involves activity on the part of the dominant owner is a positive easement. A right which does not involve activity on the part of the dominant owner is a negative easement. So the law requires only four kinds of negative easements. The right to the flow of water through an artificial channel, uh, the right to a flow of air, the right to a flow of light to a particular aperture, and the right to the servient land support for buildings on the dominant land. So very strange and limited cases. And it was held in FIPS and PEARS that no other negative easements can exist. And very finally, sub rule five, the right must not require the servient owner actively to do something except to maintain a fence. It is essential to the concept of an easement that the servient owner's role is passive, an obligation requiring the servient owner to engage in expenditure of money or undertake a positive action cannot therefore qualify as an easement. There is one exception to this rule. In Jones and Price, the Court of Appeal held that a right requiring the servient owner to maintain a boundary fence is a valid easement. And then we've got a case here, Rans and Elvin, and a water company, in this case, a water company supplied water to the dominant and servient land through pipes running under the servient land. Charge for the water was made by means of a meter situated at the entrance to the servient land, and the servient owner was responsible for paying the water company's bills. The dominant owner sought a declaration that he had the benefit of an easement for the uninterrupted supply of water through the pipes on the defendant's land. 
Nicholas rejected the claim, so the judge Nicholas rejected the claim on the basis that the right to a water supply imposed a positive obligation on the servient owner to pay for the supply so as to maintain an uninterrupted flow of water to the dominant land. And the Court of Appeal approved the positive obligation principle but held it inapplicable, inapplicable on the facts. And this was one of the quotes from the case. The rights granted is a right simply to the passage of water and no more. It does not purport to confer any right to insist on someone else ensuring the presence of water in the pipes. However, if water in fact reaches the private pipe system under the servient land by any means whatsoever, there is a pertinent to the dominant land a right that such water shall be permitted to pass through the pipes to the dominant land. No positive obligation is imposed on the servient land by such right to the passage of waters applied by another. It is the classic form of an easement of passage. The servient owner cannot do any physical act interrupting the passage of such water without being liable for an actionable interference. On the other hand, the servient owner is under no obligation to ensure that any water does in fact reach the private water system. Okay, so that now wraps up our four content requirements for an easement. And we delve right into this last content requirement and it's taken us now quite some time to, to do so. In the next video, we're going to be talking about acquisitions, so talking about express easements, legal easements, equitable easements, you know, implied easements and stuff like that. So we're going to start talking about easements more generally and I look forward to doing that next time. If you have any questions about this video, please leave a comment below and make sure you subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.